We've been on the road to deliverance, and last time I was uh, talking to you about the exception to the rule. Uh, today, I've subtitled uh, today's message, Beware of Dogs. Uh, don't worry, it's kind of throwing you off. I know that the subtitle sometimes throws people off, but uh, we're going to hopefully unpack that as we get ready to go forward in this. Let's read the Word of God here in Matthew 15. It says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. O woman, great is your faith. You know, uh, there's an exclamation point right there. Uh, but before Jesus was all cool and laid back. But if you look at this, you see he got excited. And he screams out, oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. What things soever you desire. Uh, I just skipped to Mark 11. 24, because I got ahead of myself, I got a little excited. So I ask you to excuse me. I get excited about the Word of God. Amen. And you know what? I get excited, and I love to preach to people who are excited about the Word of God. I, I, I like it. You know, I, I'll preach to people who are asleep. I'll preach just the same. Uh, but, but I like it. It, it, it feeds me uh, when I'm encouraged by our like, precious faith. Uh, when you get the Word of God and you're able to have a revelation and you're able to see the Word of God in your life, uh, uh, you respond by saying amen. And, and what you're saying, whenever you say amen, you're saying, be it unto me. I receive the Word of God. Yes, Lord. So we were talking about this woman. We realize that she is the exception to the rule. You got to understand this woman. You got to kind of go to Luke chapter 4 and when Jesus revealed himself, you know, he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel and they all were fastened on him. He was in his own hometown and he says, I know I'm in my hometown and no prophet is respected. No prophet is honored uh, in his own town and uh, the people of Nazareth, they were true to form. They were looking at him like he was crazy when he was talking about the anointing that destroys the yoke, when he was talking about deliverance of the captive. They were looking at him just like religious people look. Uh, when you start to preach the word of God, they look at you like you're crazy. When you start to talk about the power of God, because what they're used to is the form without any power. They're used to, you know, getting dressed up and looking nice and nothing happening and nothing changes. That's what religious people are used to. And Jesus comes and he breaks all of that apart. He destroys it. He annihilates uh, everything that they have known and everything that they have expected. When he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me today. Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? And so uh, he says that, they look at him like he's crazy, and then Jesus begins to preach some more. He says uh, in Luke 4, 24 to 27, he says, Assuredly I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months. And there was great famine throughout the land, but none of them was Elijah sent to except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Uh, just remember that he was speaking to that Seraphonician woman. He was in the region of Tyre and Sidon. So we see this other connection here. There's another woman during the time of Elijah from that same region of Tyre. 
of a tire in sight, and that woman is there, and Jesus says, there were many lepers in verse 27. In the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Uh, we talked about the role to, to deliverance, and we said deliverance, uh, what it means is to hurl. It's like a missile that's being hurled. It's curled with force. It means to release, to let go, or to let be. It means to release from a legal relation. There's legally uh, a bind and a connection uh, to something that is destructive, but it has a legal right to your life. That sickness, that disease, that diabetes, that thing, it has a legal right to your life. That strife, that uh, spirit of bondage, infirmity, there's a spiritual legal right. It has legal access. Uh, but deliverance means, it means to release you from the legal relation, and it means to to draw to oneself. God is drawing you and pulling you with rocket force uh, from that bondage. Uh, it means to uh, draw or snatch from danger to rescue. Ha! Uh, today I believe God is going to snatch some of you. Uh, I mean, uh, you're in bondage and the Holy Ghost is just going to snatch you. Uh, that's deliverance. We're on the road to deliverance. What is the difference between people who receive and people who don't? Because we see the many are the ones that don't. The majority, if you simply follow the masses, you're not going to be on the road to deliverance because it's too narrow. Uh, many people were suffering. Many people were poor during the time of Elijah. Many people were poor and were struggling in the bad economy of a famine. But there was one woman who was in a bad economy, but that was not affected by the bad economy. I said before that you are the exception to the rule. I don't care who all in your family have died with the disease. Pastor talks about his deliverance uh, from this. to get filled with the Holy Spirit. You were the first one, and there was a curse that followed. There was behavior, patterns that followed your bloodline, but you're able to stand with authority and, it says, and say, it stops here. And for some of you right now, maybe you have not fully exercised that authority, and you see your children running buck wild. I dare you, man of God, to rise up and say, no, you don't, devil. It stops here. That curse has been broken with me. I don't care how grown they are, you are still the father. You are still the mother. Take authority. Uh, you, re you, you release it. Praise you, Jesus. Uh, th this, this woman, uh, we, we, we see, man, this is a rough conversation she has. We talked about the fact that uh, this woman, uh, she's set apart. She's the exception uh, because... She is a worshiper. Now, remember, Jesus, he went to Tyre to hide himself. In Mark's account, you'll see that he went there and he was trying to hide. Jesus did not go to Gentile areas to minister. He evidently was going to this region to rest or to get away or to hide. Uh, from the masses, from the thousands that wanted him, you know, to multiply the loaves and fishes. Jesus is hiding. And this woman finds Jesus while he's hiding. And there was an interaction we saw uh, that she comes and Jesus doesn't say anything and it doesn't stop her. But what I like to draw out a little bit more about this woman is that she is a worshiper. That is what separates her. She is a worshiper. What does the word of God say? Uh, it says that when she comes, uh, she comes and she cries out, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, oh Lord. It says in Mark's account uh, that when she finds him, 
in verse 26, uh, it says, for the woman whose young daughter had an uncle spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. She came and fell at his feet. This woman, uh, she knows how to find her position. Some of us, we want the blessing while we're standing up. You want deliverance when you're looking at Jesus eye to eye. Uh, you, you want deliverance while you remain in your position. This woman, she is the exception because she knows how to get on her face. I mean, she can't be at his feet unless she falls on her face. She's a worshiper. She's a worshiper. She says, Lord, have mercy. She falls at his feet and says, have mercy on me. Oh, Lord, son of David, that is such a rich statement that's coming from this woman who's not even a Jew. David is not in her lineage. David has nothing to do with her. King David, that's not her history. That's not where she comes from. She would be more familiar with other kings in history. This is a woman of Tyre. She would be more familiar with the kings that come from Tyre. But this woman... She is recognizing and worshiping Jesus as the son of David. He who comes to God must believe and recognize who he is. You can't expect to receive when you're worshiping the wrong God. You can't expect to receive uh, when you are just praying to the universe. It's real, pop it's real popular and common now, talking about the universe, the universe as if the universe created itself. This woman says, recognizes. He came into his own. His own people didn't recognize who he was. But this woman, she's the exception uh, because she recognizes Jesus. Says, have mercy on me. And she worships him. I encourage you. She is a woman that had problems. She has a daughter that is demonized, uh, is in torment. All her hopes and dreams are in shambles, and she is worshiping. I mean, you would expect her to be having a pity party. Uh, you would expect her uh, to be saying, woe is me. But no, she gets out of her problem, and she begins to worship him. I encourage you right now. I'm talking to someone who is going through a real difficult time where you don't have answers, where you don't have solutions, and you need a breakthrough. I encourage you to take your eyes and focus off of yourself in your problems and begin to worship him. Worshippers receive things differently than other people who are afraid to worship. I know I got delivered because I had the spirit of cool. I was way too cool to worship. Because cool people have to think about themselves. The people who are cool, they're very aware of how other people are going to see them and that's what's messing you up. You're seeing other people. That's the contrast between David and Saul. Saul is always concerned of how other people are perceiving him. David doesn't care. Amen. Amen. That's the difference. God says, I'm going to find myself a man that's after my heart. I'm going to find a worshiper. That's a worshiper, a person who's after God. Amen. This woman, she's a worshiper, and she's a bold, radical worshiper. And she says, Jesus, son of David, Have mercy on me, O oh Lord, son of David. Where did I hear that before? Have mercy, son of Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I heard that before in the scripture somewhere. Somebody else said that. It's familiar, isn't it? Someone else cries out uh, when they're told to be quiet, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This woman is an exception, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing some commonality here uh, between her and the person who was blind and received their sight. You remember now, blind Bartimaeus, he said the same thing. He said the same thing, and everybody else told him to be quiet. 
There's a spirit uh, that is telling you to be quiet. Why? Because they want you to stay bound. Uh, there's, a, there's a voice that is saying, uh, you don't say anything. It doesn't take all that. And, and you're making too much noise. Uh, there's a voice that wants you to stay in bondage that is always telling you to behave. Uh, but you uh, I'll go ahead, and if you are desperate enough, you begin to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those people receive things that the other church folk don't. She's not afraid to cry out. No one wanted her. She interrupted the meeting. Jesus was hiding. Jesus was relaxing. Jesus was with the important people in that community and city or whatever. But she wasn't supposed to be there. But she comes in and she makes a scene. Some of us were too dignified for our deliverance. <laughs> when you want deliverance, you don't care. <laughs> you don't care. Who cares what they say? Who cares who talks about you? You're after deliverance. Now, people who don't want anything, uh, they can sit there and be important. But you're not trying to be important uh, because you're after God. Uh, you're a worshiper. You're a worshiper. Jesus, son of David, that's recognizing him as the Messiah. It's recognizing him as the rightful king, the king of kings. You see, uh, this is a kingdom concept that she understands. She's calling him son of David. That's recognizing the kingdom of God. That's recognizing his authority as king. You see, uh, when you want something, you got to know how to approach the king. You got to recognize that he is Lord. That means when she says, Jesus, my Lord, that means I'm not my own Lord. That means I'm not, I'm not living for myself, Lord. I, 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 I recognize that you own me. You are the owner. That's what Lord is. Lord is the owner. I recognize that you own it, that you are in control. And she's coming to him, recognizing who he is. She's a worshiper. She's a worshiper. Uh, we're we're going to move on, but... We might circle back to that worship part there. I might have to, I might have to come back to that because I can see uh, we, we might not have that fully. Recognize Jesus and her worship was focused. Worship was focused. She was worshiping him, worshiping him in light of the fact that her daughter needed deliverance. Remember, Praise and worship is also a weapon. In Friday night prayer, uh, Fiona, she read uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, where King Jehoshaphat uh, in Israel, they were surrounded by, uh, the, you know, the people of Ammon and uh, Mount Seir and the Moabites. They were surrounding them, and it looked like they were all going to die because the enemies were surrounding them. And they went into battle, knowing that the battle was not theirs, but the Lord's. And they went in saying, the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. They went in singing. The praisers and the worshipers went, for, went first into battle singing. You see, we, we're used to trying to fight it out. Uh, but I encourage you to sing it out. Uh, sing out the victory. Uh, one time, uh, one Sunday morning, I was going through some stuff, and Brad, Pastor Brandon just happened to come through my office, and he came with a prophetic word. He said, the Lord told me to tell you to begin to sing to that problem there. Uh, begin to sing to it. Hallelujah. Sing a new song uh, to that problem. Uh, it, you see, when we come to church and, and we sing, some of you take the praise and worship for granted and you just say, you know what, I'll just come in late for the preaching. That's why you stay in that spot because you didn't realize uh, that your deliverance was in the beginning when you come to church on time in the praise service. You didn't realize that your deliverance was there when
when you start to sing and clap your hands, the pray, you see you, the enemy has you say, ah, yeah, I'm going to come in late, I'm going to come in late. And the devil has tricked you and duped you thinking that all you need to do is get the word. No, no, you need to get the word, but you need to worship him. Uh, you don't even have a revelation. God can't even speak to you because when the prophet wanted to speak a word from God, he said, give me a musician. I'm not just going to prophesy. The reason why I can preach because I've worshiped before I preached. It's not just a song. It's power. There is power in your worship. There is power and deliverance in your praise. She's a worshiper. She is an exception to the rule because she is humble. My, this is a humble woman. She knew she didn't deserve it. She knew she didn't earn the right to be delivered. She knew her deliverance had nothing to do with her. There's a principle that God exalts the humble. It's very difficult for us to humble ourselves because we want to hold on to our positions and we want to hold on to our reputation. But the Bible says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who did not even consider his reputation. When Jesus hung on the cross naked, he didn't care what people thought. The Bible says he endured the cross, despising the shame. It means he diminished the value of the shame. He didn't give the shame the power. He endured despising the shame. This woman, she's humble. I say she's humble. She recognizes she doesn't deserve it. Understanding that in my flesh dwells no good thing. So I can't look at any past accomplishments and think I deserve it. I can't look at uh, my works and say, because I do all this stuff, I, I, I need to be recognized and I need to be appreciated for all this stuff I do. I know because the Bible says our righteous works are as filthy rags, so I can't count on that for my deliverance. I can never pray enough. I can never study enough. I can never work hard enough to earn this deliverance. The woman, she taps into a kingdom principle, realizing this is, this is all God. And it has, my deliverance has nothing to do with me. What I do is I receive. And I put my trust in what Jesus has already done. Stop trying to work for it and start worshiping it, worshiping for it. Uh, her, her worship is focused, uh, and, and she recognizes in her humility that she doesn't deserve a seat at the table. First of all, she's a woman. A woman, uh, they were outcasts in society. They were uh, maligned in, the, in that society, and Jesus elevates womanhood. Where they rejected her, Jesus elevates her. On top of that, the church people didn't want her there. The disciples said, get rid of her. Tell her to go. Nobody wants her there, but she's humble because she does not allow offense to set in. This is a different kind of woman because what Jesus says, after she's knocked on all these doors and found him while he was hiding, after all that, and she finally gets to him in her desperate situation, Jesus would appear that he is disrespectful to her, that he treats her as less. And the church people around, the disciples around her, they were very rude to her. There's enough reason. If she wanted to be offended, she has enough reason to be offended. Everyone was rude to her. Everybody was mean to her. But doesn't stop her. You see, offense is a trap. Yes. You have to be aware of offense. Uh, offenses, the Bible says, will come. 
Uh, it's going to come from your enemies, and offense is going to come from people who are your brothers and sisters. And the people who are closest to you very likely are going to offend you. The people who would, you would expect to encourage you and build you up and support you are going to be the very ones that will offend you. And how you respond when offense comes is going to determine whether or not you're in a position to receive. Offense will come. And some of us, we got stuck right there. Because she could have got stuck. I mean, you don't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs? I'm out of here. I thought you were a man of God. I thought you were talking about love. I mean, that was a point for her to storm out. The rich young ruler would have been gone. He would, I mean, he, Jesus was even nice to him, and he left offended. This, you could say, Jesus wasn't being too nice. First of all, he didn't speak to her at first. He didn't answer her when she comes crying, pouring out her soul, and you're pouring out your heart to God, and you go, God, where are you? And sometimes it seems like the heavens are shut. It seems like when you need God to speak, Lord, where are you? And sometimes it seems like God is not saying anything. What you do? I mean, many people get offended right there. There are so many people who have turned away from the faith because they got offended with God. My mother was a woman of God. She was a praying woman. She did everything right, and she believed you. She stood in faith, and we all prayed. We believed God. We fasted. We call on you. You are a God of miracles. You have all power. And she still died. I'm done with this. She had every reason when the heavens were silent in the flesh to walk away. I want to encourage you right now who are, you're, you're, you're tempted to give up. You're tempted to quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't walk away. Uh, stay right in there. Uh, even though you don't see it in the natural, even though you don't hear anything in the natural, does not mean that the love of God uh, has left you. Doesn't mean that the grace of God has been exhausted. Doesn't mean that God is not still on the throne. He's in control, and the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Uh, it doesn't matter the enemies that are surrounding me. It doesn't matter the doubt that wants to come into my mind. I can, I can encourage you to continue to declare the Lord is good Lord but you you see me I, I want to be married and I'm still single the Lord is good uh, Lord I see everybody else they seem to be going on with the life uh, but what's happening with me the Lord is good uh, Lord you see my husband uh, he, what's wrong uh, I, he, he's supposed to be delivered by now the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever that has nothing to do with my circumstance that is who God is It's who he is. He's a good God. He's a good God. Uh, she, she doesn't carry offense. She doesn't allow offense. She's an intercessor. Sets her apart because she's not thinking just about herself. She's interceding for her daughter. In this I mean, there could have been a lot of things that are going on because when I look at this text, I wonder, where is the daughter's father? What happened to him? Doesn't call her a widow. Just says she's a woman. The scripture knows how to make, how to refer to a widow when it's a widow. So because it doesn't call her a widow, you can make an assumption that the father is still, th is still there. I, I, I don't know what all is going on, but this woman is thinking beyond herself and beyond her own pain for the deliverance of someone else. You see, when you start to realize it's not about you, when we get to that place where we have accepted, it's not about me, Lord. It's not just about my happiness. It's not about my comfort, Lord. Uh, this is your name that is involved. Uh, 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 I look, Ezekiel speaks about God looking for someone to stand in the gap and could not find anyone. 
uh, this, this, this weekend, we're going to be calling men to pray. Amen. And we're going to see among the men who, who of us are willing to stand in the gap and intercede uh, for our brothers that are dying. Intercede for the lost. Intercede for the city. Intercede for our families. Which man is going to stand in the gap? You'll have an opportunity to intercede. Intercede to stand in the gap. This woman was an intercessor. And my final point, I see she's a worshiper. I see this woman was humble. And this is where uh, I want you to brace yourself because you're about to be offended about this teaching. This is, I mean, so far it's been amen, praise the Lord. Now I'm going to say something and you're going to start to look at me like I'm funny. So I'm, I'm giving you a heads up. This is what's going to happen. She's a worshiper. She was humble. She's a humble woman. Third, and this is what makes her the exception to the rule. She was a dog. Jesus said, you don't take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Dog was an unclean animal. The dog was a, a detestable animal among the Jewish people. Uh, when you talk about the dogs, the dogs hung out with the dead. They ate dead things. They, uh, you see in the parable of Lazarus, the dogs are licking his wounds like he's already dead. Uh, it says, the, the prophet says to Jezebel, the dogs are going to lick your blood. Uh, dogs are not an animal that's an esteemed animal. Jesus, uh, you know, Psalm 22 describes the crucifixion and says, many dogs have surrounded me waiting for him to die. But the dog also referred to Gentiles among the children of Israel. The Gentiles were referred to as dogs. Unclean. Uh, and as I was looking at this text, and she says, you know, give the children's bread and this thing is based on covenant. This thing is based on relationship. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be loosed whom Satan has bound? She has a right for deliverance because she is a covenant child. Uh, if, if it's not involving the blood, uh, the blood uh, is what speaks healing. The blood of the everlasting covenant gives you the right. You see, this thing is not based on emotion. This thing is based on rights. Unless you understand covenant, you cannot properly understand faith. Thing is not based on feeling, it's not based on need. The kingdom is based on rights, citizen rights. And so because she's a daughter of Abraham, she should not be bound. And Jesus uses this same point to say, look, there were many lepers in Israel based on the covenant. He is Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals them, and they died with their leprosy. And so they did not benefit from the covenant that God revealed himself as the Lord that heals. None of these diseases were to come upon them. I am the Lord that heals you, but yet the people of God missed out on the covenant. She says, I'm not come for you, I'm come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I've come for my own people. Salvation is of the Jews. You need to develop a heart and a love for the Jewish people. Uh, because if you really want to receive revi see revival, if you are interested in revival, let the Jews start getting saved. Let the Jews start coming to realize that Jesus is the Messiah, Messiah the promised Messiah. Then you really see revival in the church. So, uh, Jesus says, I didn't come for you. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, you don't take the children's bread and give it to the little dogs. It's too good for dogs. The blessing that I bring is too good. It's too much quality to just give it to dogs. You don't give this kind of anointing. You don't give this kind of deliverance to dogs. 
And Jesus said, in essence, you're a dog. Now, if Jesus says, you're a dog, how are you going to argue? <laughs> so what if she says? She says, yes, Lord. I'm a dog. Yes, Lord. I'm a dog. Bow, wow, wow. Yippee, yo, yippee. Yes, Lord. Now, where I'm about to go right now, uh, Fiona is not going to be able to follow me. Now, there's a part where this woman uh, is coming, and I don't understand what it is to be a woman. And so, I couldn't preach that like maybe she could because she knows what it is to give birth to a child and to have a burden for that child that you gave birth to. She understands that. Uh, I can't relate. But now, when we start talking about dogs, she can't go with me here because she doesn't know what it is uh, 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 to, to love a dog. We have everybody in our family, we all want a dog. I'm about to preach right now. Everybody in our family wants a dog, and there's just one vote. I want a dog. Carlton wants a dog. Sophia wants a dog. Lydia wants a dog. We all want a dog, and there's one person. I'm not going to name any names. One person that is denying all of us a dog. So I got a point of reference here because I understand dog somewhat. Had a dog named Rocky. This dog was the best dog ever. Man, the dog, he used to, you know, in the wintertime, he, he, he would all sleep in my bed and he'd keep my feet warm. I mean, we, 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 I, I had this dog from a puppy. I didn't realize uh, the hurt and the pain from losing an animal. I'm telling you, I was a grown man. I was married. And when my dog died, I cried like a baby. I didn't cry over people like I cried over that dog. I wasn't, exp I wasn't ready for it. Dog lived 18 years. Uh, heroic dog. Telling you the dog was a hero. Wasn't an ordinary dog. I'm telling you one time, my aunt, my aunt, she fell down the stairs. My parents were in Israel. My aunt was, was watching us. She fell all the way down the stairs. And she couldn't move. But my dog, he has super hearing. Heard her fall down the stairs while I was asleep. And, you know, she, she, she was one that was against anything nasty. Anytime I've touched a dog, I had to wash my hands. You touch the dog. People are people and dog is dog. You touch the dog, but that don't come nasty. That was her. But because she fell down the stairs, Rocky was able to get to her and he licked her until he was tired. Licked her face, she couldn't move. And after Rocky, was done licking her, he realized the situation, she needed to get help. So Rocky ran upstairs and got, got to me, and he started pulling my covers off. He started getting to me, scratching me, doing everything to wake me up. I'm going to get off, get off, scratching me, pulling me. And eventually I hear my aunt down the stairs moaning. And so when he sees I wake up, Rocky ran ahead of me and got some more licks in before I got to her. <laughs> Heroic dog. He says, even the little dogs eat the crumbs. Can I, can I preach this for a second? Because this is the exception. Uh, I, I, had, I, I had myself... A double, I'm sorry, it wasn't a double, it was a bacon double cheeseburger. Burger King had two for one. And I was eating my bacon double cheeseburger. I, 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 I'm, 
I'm, I'm a teenager at the time, and, you know, dad would come home, and the first thing he says when he sees a dog, the first name he calls is Paul. Take the dog for a walk. So I got to go outside in the middle, and he, my, my dad has interrupted my meal. And so I go with my bacon double cheeseburger, and I'm walking the dog. Hurry up, hurry up, Rocky, do what you're going to do. But Rocky's interested in my bacon double cheese. And so he's jumping on me for me to get him some, and he's not getting any of my bacon double cheese burger. But see, you don't get this if you don't know dogs. So Rocky, he times me. Because every time he'd walk, he, he, he's coming, if, he, if, if it's on this leg, he's coming on this side, and I just kick him. He comes, I just kick him. Now my dog is part pit bull, all right? So he, he sees me, and he times me. He acts like he's doing something, and I'm thinking he's just going to the bathroom. I'm sitting there enjoying my burger. All of a sudden, from behind, he comes behind, leaps, snatches it out my hand. And so this starts to make sense. Why this woman is the exception is starting to make sense. Uh, all right. You, you, you sports fans are going to understand this, all right? I'm stuck basketball-wise. I'm stuck in the 1990s, all right? And you kind of know why. Uh, during our, our, our championship years, the Chicago Bulls, uh, we, had two, we had two guys, Hall of Famers, uh, uh, Michael and Scotty, uh, when we won our first three championships. Uh, that was a time when we would, we would do battle with the Pistons and the Knicks. The New York Knicks, they were bigger and stronger than us. Uh, but when, whenever we would start to lose, uh, they had a coach named Tex Winters. And, uh, he, he, and Phil Jackson would just sit there. He didn't have to get excited. But Phil Jackson, when the Bulls would start losing uh, in the playoffs, he would just sit there and do like this. That means lock him up. They had this play defensively. It was called release the Dobermans. And Michael and Scotty, when they released the Dobermans, uh, they would come with the tenacious D and they would shut the team down, and they, they, would, they would win. They would be able to shut the team down because they released the Dobermans. Uh, all right, in um, Genesis 49, Genesis 49, uh, you see Jacob blessing his children. And when you get to around verse 27 thereabouts, it starts to prophesy over Benjamin. And the Bible says that Benjamin is a dog. He is a ravenous wolf. Is a, he's a hungry dog. A ravenous wolf is a hungry dog. Uh, and he shall devour his prey and at night divide the spoil. You see, the difference between those who win and those who don't, those who win and those who grab on, they have a dog on the inside of them. Uh, there's a dog that won't quit. There's a dog on the inside uh, that separates the winners from the losers that won't take no for an answer. That's why many people miss out on the blessing. Uh, but the reason why this woman is the exception is because she has a dog on the inside of her. And like a pit bull, a pit bull, they have, um, they don't technically have lot jaw, uh, but what they have is uh, they have strong jaw muscles, and the thing about the pit bull is that their psyche is different than other animals, other even other dogs. Uh, when they lock hold, it's, it, it, it's in the jaw. Uh, it, it's in your mouth. Uh, it's in your confession. Uh, when you lock in with your confession, when you begin to speak the word of God and you lock in on the promise of God, uh, the, the, the pit bull will not let go. Uh, even when it's time to let go, some of those dogs will even die holding on and not letting go. They will die.
die in faith, not letting go of the promise. You see, this woman had something on the inside of her uh, that would make her lock in and refuse to let go and hold on to the promise of God was realized. I do have a dogged determination concerning the word of God, concerning the things of God. And what my dog did is, uh, it says, it says uh, the, the, this woman uh, eats the crumbs like the dog that falls from the master's table. Uh, you see, when you, when you understand a dog, a dog doesn't wait for it to hit the ground. A dog, a dog is going to get it out the air. A dog is going to sniff it out. Uh, and and, and it, she, 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 he, the dog's going to sniff it out. She, can you see this woman? There's a dog. Where's Jesus? Uh, where, I know it's there. Uh, she's going to search. She's going to search. She's hungry. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Where is it? Where is it? And, and if it's in the atmosphere, uh, a, a dog is able to get it out the air. In other words, uh, there are forces to keep you down. There are forces to keep you in bondage. Uh, but when you have that thing, on the inside of you, you defy the gravity of sin. You defy the gravity uh, that is keeping you sick. You defy the gravity and the forces that are keeping you upset and miserable. The gravity uh, toward divorce. The gravity toward living in pain and in defeat. You defy the gravity uh, by going up to catch the promise in the air. You don't wait for it to hit the ground. You jump up and grab it. Hallelujah. The glory is here. The glory is here. Uh, whatever you may need, it's in the atmosphere. Whatever you may need, reach out and receive it. Take it. Uh, you don't wait for permission. You don't wait to be like. Take it. That's what you do. It's on the inside of you. That's the difference. That's the difference. That's the difference. That's the difference between you and everybody else. There's no pride. There's no pride. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you like. I don't care what you say. Uh, because I'm after something. I, I don't care if you look at me funny. I don't care if you invite me. I know I'm after something. Are you after something this morning? Are you after the promise of God this morning? Uh, Jesus said, great is your faith. Uh, she has a faith that won't let go. She has a faith that won't be denied. She has a faith that won't withstand your feet. I'm done. I'm done. Haroko Shite. Oh, glory, glory. I, I, I pray uh, that the fire enters your belly. And I pray uh, that you get locked jaw on the promise of God and you refuse to be denied. That you refuse to let go. That you grab it uh, because it's in the air. And, and, and you're going to grab it uh, like your companion.